Good morning. Good morning. Where are you this morning? All right, wonderful. I like that. So here we are at the last Sunday of the year. And for me, it's been an interesting year. Um, sometimes it's felt long, and at other times it's felt like it's gone by in the flash of an eye. And sometimes it seems like it's moving at warp speed. And I often wonder if that's because I'm getting older. <laughs> And I recognize that. But um, I'm trying to work myself into a state of being where I don't worry about time anymore. I want to do my best to live as positively and as constructively as I can without being fixated on the process of time. And it's an interesting process because much of what we do in life is driven by our schedules and by time frames. And so I've gotten so accustomed to living in those that it's becoming a challenge to try to break that habit. So that's one of my New Year's revolution, resolutions, probably a revolution as well. <laughs> and, uh, with all of that being said, I think the year end is always a constructive time for us to do some self inventory. It gives us an opportunity to understand ourselves a little bit better. Also gives us an opportunity to celebrate the fact that we've been able to make it through another calendar year. And believe you me, the further you move along on the spectrum, the more happy you are about that because you realize uh, that at any given point in time, life can end. You know, I've been doing this work for 30-some years, and over the course of my career, I have eulogized and funeralized uh, people all the way from a two-year-old child to a 102-year-old woman. Uh, so there is no guaranteed time spectrum for any of us. We just get this incredible gift called life, and we get the opportunity to give it the best we can. And sometimes we have to stop and take inventory. What have we learned? What have we accomplished? What can we do better? How appreciative are we for the people in our lives? And how appreciative are we for ourselves, even with our perceived shortcomings? These, I think, are important questions to ask ourselves. Uh, even taking a look at some of the stuff that we like to keep hidden behind the curtain. Uh, and it's worth taking a look at ourselves even if we are in uh, what, what is sync with that John Denver tune, I am perfect in every way. Anybody remember that song? Or am I the only one who felt like that was a good song? <laughs> Perfect in every way. I've tried that at home. It doesn't work. <laughs> I've been reading a little Emerson this week because I often imagine myself sitting in the pews at some church in New England with him standing in the pulpit and delivering one of his mind-boggling sermons. He says that we know each other very well. Which of us has been just to himself and that which we teach or behold? Which of us has been just to that? And he's asking the question because sometimes we behold these grand ideas in our hearts and in our souls, but how much do we live up to them? And so he's challenging us to, to come up to a different level. Which of us lives up to our aspiration, something that we aspire towards? Are we giving it our honest effort? It's a good question, and it's a good statement, and it's good food for thought, because today, Spiritually, we have to be on guard all the time. Scrutiny is everywhere. 
I saw an interesting experience a few weeks ago where there was a family at a um, at the basketball stadium, and there were uh, three people sitting in front of them who were standing up and they were getting engaged in the game. And sitting behind these three people are a husband and a wife and two small children. And so uh, I've been in basketball games where people, and concerts where people stand and they get into it, and so you're sitting and it's difficult to get engaged in the game. So uh, they had asked the people two or three times to sit and they remain standing and cheering and then things got heated. And so as a result of the heatedness, uh, some statements were made in front of the children and um, they were put on social media. And so feedback was instant. It was instantaneous. And people were emailing them and twittering and twerping or whatever they do. I, all of this stuff is way beyond me. I, I'm still trying to catch up with the cell phone. But, you know, so all of this feedback is coming at them instantaneously. And of course, there's embarrassment when you are out of character and you say things that you, you wouldn't typically say. Uh, but in another setting, who are you really? I mean, where does this stuff come from? Where does it come from when we get so angry that we burst out with all of these expletives and uh, in front of children and, and all of that? Where does that come from? And so as a result, as I said, there's been a lot of talk about that and, and a lot of defensiveness, that is not who I am. Well, it probably isn't. But sometimes we put our foot in our mouths and sometimes we do things and we say things that we shouldn't do. And as a result of that, we have some consequences. We can't hide behind the curtain of being anonymous once we step out and do something that we believe is out of character for ourselves, we have to work with the consequences. So every day on social media, somebody is scrutinizing <clears throat> somebody else. And we're being scrutinized for behaviors that we might internally believe don't represent who we are. But if they're taking place, they do represent who we are in another context. So there's a lot to be learned. Emerson said, what you do speaks so loud that I cannot hear what you say. <coughs> what you do speaks so loud that I cannot hear what you say. So once you've done something, it's made an indelible print that already kind of defines you, whether you think it does or not. And so it's important for us to be on guard. In this quote by Emerson, he's challenging the reader to go beyond his or her ordinary perceptions of self and others. And as a result of that looking beyond, to see if there is any dissonance between that which we know about ourselves or that which we, what we know about ourselves and, and how we live our lives, both personally and as, as a citizen of the world, he's encouraging us to scrutinize that, to take a look at it. And his musings were based on knowing himself quite well, and he also knew his contemporaries quite well. One of my favorite jokes about Emerson and Thoreau is said that they were on Walden Pond and they were each philosophizing and that one would give a statement and the other would try to top the statement and so they did this for a couple of times and then uh, Thoreau looks at Emerson and he said, once would be enough. I got it the first time. 
But philosophers like to go on and on. Learning how to understand ourselves is a challenging thing for all of humanity. It really is, because we are so accustomed to acting from instinct that sometimes we do things before we stop and think. And when they don't match up with what we say we are, or what we say we believe, it gets complicated. And it gets even more complicated when we consider the fact that each of us is uniquely individualistic. Ye gas. <laughs> <laughs> It's kind of a shock to the system. <laughs> We're incredibly individualistic, and so all, all, that individualism shows up in everything we do. You know, I, I have this, what they call a preacher's voice, so sometimes when I'm speaking, uh, there's people hearing it from a different space than where I'm speaking from. I'm speaking from the depths of, of my being, uh, but I don't mean for it to sound like it's knocking someone down, but they get the effect that, wow, that was harsh. <laughs> so it's perceptions, and we all give those off, you know, and it's important for us to, to be wary of that, get off from behind this curtain that we cover ourselves with and just be real the best way we possibly can. If I remember correctly, there's a, a story in the book of Joshua. And there's a, the story is about an Old Testament prophet by the name of Habakkuk. And Habakkuk is kind of a long, unwinding story about what is called the curtains of Midian. And Midian is a Middle Eastern spot out in the desert where the Midianites lived. And they had this interesting ritual that they conducted. Being in the desert, of course, they had to have some shading from the sun, so they had created tents for their tribe. And the tents, the windows of the tents were actually closed uh, during the day uh, to keep out the heat of the sun. But at night, they would open the curtains so that the desert winds could blow through. And so Habakkuk, uh, being quite the, uh, well, shall I gently put this, the egotist that he was, um, had this idea that he should be able to control the community. And so he decided that he'd close the curtains any time he chose to close them. And so that created a lot of dissonance among the tribe. The people then began to fight amongst themselves, began to argue amongst themselves. They wouldn't talk to him because he's, quote, the man in charge. So they just fought and fussed amongst themselves. And Finally, he got to the point where he decided that he was going to open the curtains all the time, and the tribe could come and go as they chose. Well, as that happened, then people from neighboring tribes would be passing by, and they decided that when they were passing by, they'd stop in and rest from the noonday heat. And Habakkuk didn't like that idea, because he didn't like the idea of strangers coming into his tribe. And so then, again, he decides to keep the curtains closed. Well, the heat from keeping the curtains closed all the time created so much tension and so much angst and so much anxiety that things just got worse and worse and worse. And so finally, it got to the point where he had no choice but to go in and stop all the fighting amongst themselves and then start to sit down and talk about what was troubling them and also talk about the fact that why was it neighboring tribes weren't welcome? 
why were they not allowed in to get out of the heat and the sun? And so they had to work all of that out. And finally, they decided to open the curtains and to keep them open both day and night, which also meant that they were developing a new level of trust, beginning to trust the neighboring tribes. And after they made that decision, their lives got better. One simple decision that it took them months to come to. One simple decision and one simple action changed their whole tribal life. Who are we? On any given day, we are shy, we can be boring, or on any given day, we can be helpless, or we can feel helpless. Yet, on any given day, we can be spectacular. We can be bold. We can be heroes. So it just depends on the day, and it depends on the attitude. That the attitude. And when we begin to view life from that perspective, which is what Emerson was trying to teach, then it starts to make sense to stop hiding behind the curtains that we actually draw around ourselves and just create a new life for ourselves. Remember Zorro? Anybody in here old enough to remember Zorro? Or am I the only comic strip? <laughs> Zorro. Uh, without his cloak, he felt helpless. But when he had his cloak on, he felt invincible. What's the difference? Just had the cloak off. The difference wasn't in reality, it was in here, in his imagination. We are incredible beings, spiritual beings. We're invincible, we're creative, we're constructive, We've created an amazing world. And what one scientist said is actually just a blink in eternity. But we have the opportunity to create an even more amazing world by opening our hearts and our minds to everything around us and being able to see it and filter it through a lens that is spiritually pure so that we're never standing in judgment of others, so that we're always loving and considerate of others, so that we're all learning from each other. All of these wonderful experiences that come together to create an incredible world. I didn't know that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is also a musician, but she tells the story of growing up at a point in time in America when there were no women in orchestras. And the auditioners, the people who usually chose the people who participated in the orchestras, were all men. And they thought that women played instruments differently than men, and that they could tell the difference. And so, they always felt justified when they were able to deny a woman the opportunity to join the orchestra. And then some thinking person devised a simple plan. What they did was to drop a curtain between the auditioners and the people who were trying out, and lo and behold, they could not tell the difference on the instrumentation. And so from that point forward, women began to get jobs in symphony orchestras. And now there are very few symphony orchestras that don't have probably uh, at least equal amount of representation in those orchestras, all because of a simple decision to drop the curtain. 
And it's amazing the symbology of a curtain. It's probably as powerful a symbol as you can find because when you can't see something, your perceptions have to be opened up. You have to feel. You have to hear. You have to be willing. But if the curtain is closed, then you can come up with any amount of excuses to defend whatever is taking place. So this is the last Sunday of the year. And it's a poignant reminder that we can prepare ourselves for the, the only real constant in life, which is change. It's the only real constant in life. It's always changing. And it's our job to keep up with it to the best of our ability. So this is the last Sunday you're going to see me this year. <laughs> God bless. So let's take a moment to take some quiet time and reflect on our lives, on our mission, on our values on our hopes, on our dreams, on our present, and on our future. The Bible reveals very clearly that there is no separation between us and God. probably the greatest revelation in the scriptures. It's a verse that says, I am closer to you than hands and feet. So as we breathe into that reality, and let go of our hold on the external world, Let's open our hearts and our minds, our spirits, those divine sparks within us. The sparks that connect us Remind us of our humanity. And the sparks that inspire us to create a better world, a better life, a better experience for ourselves and for all of us around, all of those around us. allowing those sparks to energize us and to heal us and to strengthen us and to encourage us. So I invite you to get comfortable in your seat. Let me take a deep, refreshing breath. Just allow your body to relax. Just breathe and relax. So 
mentally let go of any concerns. Any challenges that you might feel that are breaching your life. Just let them go. The Apostle Paul reminded us that Christ in you is your hope of glory. Whatever is grand and glorious in our lives, it's because of that divine spark and the realization of it in our nature and the expression of it in everything we do and say and think. And the remembrance of it when we step out of character, our true character, and become someone we do not wish to be. So we give thanks for the constant awareness the spirit of Christ that is in us. And so it is. And amen. This message has been brought to you by Unity Church of San Antonio to open your heart, transform your life, and celebrate your divine identity. Visit us on the web at www.unityofsa.org. And remember, you are the light of God, so shine brightly today.